Well, good morning. <laughs> My name is Marissa Gertz, and I serve as one of the pastors here with absolute pleasure. And last week, we started a new worship series that we are calling This We Believe, where we are looking deeply at the Apostles' Creed to understand what it is that we profess or believe to be true about who God is and how those beliefs should inform the way we live our lives. So to help us do that this morning, I invite you to travel back in time with me to the first century as the Apostle Paul stepped off a boat and onto the main docks in the city of Athens. Off into the distance, he could see the beautiful metropolis of elaborate stone columns and glistening buildings. As he walks through the bustling city, he notice, notices the vast number of monuments constructed to a multitude of many different gods. Even statues dedicated to an unknown god. I would imagine that this site deeply grieved Paul's heart because he knows what it is to experience a personal encounter with a God whom he could name, a God who he could describe and identify through the ways that God is active in the world and in his own life. So after spending some time getting to know the city and the people, Paul found his way to the central governing place. Maybe he stood on the front steps of that building and invited anyone who was standing nearby to come in close. In Acts 17, beginning in verse 22, uh, Acts gives us an account of what Paul shares to the people in Athens. I invite you to read along with me this morning. Paul stood up in the middle of the council on Mars Hill and said, People of Athens, I see that you are very religious in every way. As I was walking through town and carefully observing your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. What you worship as unknown, I now proclaim to you. God, who made the world and everything in it, is Lord of heaven and earth. He doesn't live in temples made with human hands, nor is God served by human hands as though he needed something, since he is the one who gives life, breath, and everything else. From one person, God created every human nation to live on the whole earth having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their lands. God made the nations so they would seek him, perhaps even reach out to him and find him. In fact, God isn't far away from any of us. In God, we live, move, and exist. As some of your own poets said, we are his offspring. This is the word of God given to us as the children of God, and we all say, thanks be to God. Will you join me in prayer? Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts this morning be found pleasing in your sight. For you, O oh God, are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. What we see Paul share in this moment before Athens and what several other apostles shared throughout the book of Acts is the beginning of unifying creedal language to differentiate Christian thoughts and beliefs from the multitude of gods on display in Athens. Paul offers words that expressed the experience and story of an entire faith community, of a God who creates, a God who comes close, 
a God who longs for us to live, move, and exist connected to that divine source. Fast forward a couple hundred years, the Christian faith has exploded across the known world. Pockets of Christian communities were scattered in every corner, each with their own distinguishing features as Christian thought and language was infused with culture and ancient traditions of those different places. As Christianity grew, so did the need for people to understand exactly who God is and how God is revealed to us in the person of Jesus Christ. Between the second and third centuries, a pseudo-Christian religious movement called Gnosticism and a couple other groups threatened to uproot the Christian understanding of exactly who Christ was. That had been passed down from the apostles who walked alongside Jesus. So in response to these groups, the first form of the Apostles' Creed was penned. The creed was a way to distinguish the true apostolic Christian tradition from any of the divergent beliefs that started to sprout and would continue to sprout in years to come. It offered clear, concise language to name the distinctly Christian experience and witness of a risen Christ. Even today, the Apostles' Creed is used in worship, unifying all Christians as a statement of faith. It's shared between Catholics and Protestants. It builds a bridge between different Protestant denominations like Baptists and Methodists. And dare I say, it could build a bridge between United Methodists and Global Methodists. In his book, Creed, Adam Hamilton says, Belief in the Christian God is meant to fundamentally change our perspective on the world, on our place in it, and on our own lives. So if what the creed says is important, what exactly does it say about the God we profess our belief in? We believe, the creed says, in God the Father Almighty creator of heaven and earth. At first glance, it seems as though this statement isn't actually saying a whole lot about the God we profess belief in. However, in just nine words, the author of the Apostles' Creed lays the groundwork for how we might experience and understand who God is. Luke Timothy Johnson, an author of another book, called the creed, suggests that because the language of the creed is compressed, it can sometimes be cryptic. So we need to look at each individual statement and examine it alongside all of the other statements the creed makes in order for us to grasp the deepest meaning of what we are professing. So when we hold this statement about God up against the other statements in the Apostles' Creed, we see that God is spoken of more than in just these nine words. In fact, the entire creed describes what we believe to be about God, what we believe about God, because we believe in a God who's Trinitarian, This means that we believe in one God in three persons. God the Father, Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, and the Holy Spirit. Each of these persons are addressed in different sections of the creed, naming how their divine activity differs from one another. And yet, we profess that each person is God. Also within these nine words is what we believe about the first person of the Trinity's relationality and activity, or how God relates to Christ and to humanity, and how God is active in the world right here and right now. First, 
we profess our belief in God the Father. In doing so, we name that one way we can experience God in our lives is through the metaphor of a loving parent. Throughout the gospel accounts, we see that Jesus addresses God as Father over 165 times. In prayer, as he cries out, Abba, Father, in the Garden of Gethsemane before his arrest. Or in various conversations as he's describing the relationship between God and himself to his disciples or other followers. My understanding of God as parent dramatically shifted the moment that I became a parent myself. When my oldest son, Christian, calls out for me in the middle of the night, it does not matter if I am sleeping like a rock. I will jolt out of bed and sprint to his room and knock over any toy that is in my way. <laughs> he might have only had a nightmare about the monsters in the closet or under the bed or in the bathroom. But I have the opportunity and the privilege to hold him as he falls back asleep, reminding him by whispering in his ear that he is loved and that he is safe. And what I hope Christian experiences in that moment and feels from me is comfort and love in return. Comfort, love, safety, belonging, provision. These are the things that loving and present parents do to the very best of our ability. And these are the ways we believe that God relates to us and relates to Christ. Second, we profess our belief in God the Father Almighty. When we add this one word to our profession, we place God above all things. We claim that God is sovereign and all-powerful over all that is happening in our lives and in the world around us. This is not a God who stands far off, watching from a distance with their arms folded and shaking their head. But one who is present and active in our lives. Paul explains this in his letter to the Romans in chapter 8, verse 28, that God works for the good of those who love God. The word that Paul uses here to describe the work is the, ver the word synergy, which literally means co-working or working together. That God is active in the midst of all that is happening in our lives, at our worst moments, working alongside us, experiencing it with us. Luke Timothy Johnson says it this way, God's almighty goodness is shown to, us, shown to its most astounding perfection and God's power to draw good even from what creatures experience as evil. When it's easy to spot places in our world where, where evil seems to reign, front and center, in war, in suffering, in chronic illness, in poverty, to profess God, that God is almighty, is to intentionally look for glimpses of light in the darkness. To look back on the worst moments of our own lives. To see how God was walking with us, even when we could not see or feel God at that time. It is to claim God's goodness in all times and in every season. Finally, we believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. As creator, we remember the words of Genesis 1, that in the beginning God spoke 
into a formless void, bringing light, sky, water, soil, plants, creatures of every kind, the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and humans. Each and everything that God created, God created with the ability to reflect the one who made them. However, we often fall into this thought that God created one time, a long, long, long time ago, and that creation is something of history. But when we profess that God is the creator, we also acknowledge that creation is constantly evolving. God is actively and continually creating and recreating. Our sniffles and watery eyes here in Gainesville in the middle of spring is evidence that creation is sprouting new life as we speak. Texas was the first U.S. state to fall into darkness Monday as the total solar eclipse made its way across the country. The chief meteorologist for a network called Next Star, Brian James, was there waiting in the path with his family, and he got out his phone to record a video of the three minutes of totality that he experienced. And that self-made video went viral. And in it, you can hear the utter awe in his voice as he was describing what it felt like. He says, it looks like it's 45 minutes after sunset. It's the middle of the day, and I am counting stars outside. James wasn't alone in this awestruck experience. Millions of people across our country took a few moments to step outside and gaze up at the heavens. Video footage from different places document a communal experience of awe and wonder as people shared cheers of excitement and joy, laughter, some tears, all of this in knitting together a communal core memory that will be told for years to come. I wonder if as people looked up through their eclipse glasses, if they asked the question, how? Or maybe their question was, who? Maybe others still heard a distant refrain of a psalmist who wrote thousands of years ago. When I look up at your skies, at what your fingers made, the moon and the stars that you set firmly in place, what are human beings that you think about them? What are human beings that you pay attention to them? Adam Hamilton says it this way. When we look at the universe as it is, we see a reflection not of the random functioning of various forces, but a reflection of the creativity, joy, and majesty of the one who has created. Through creation... God continues to be active, not only in our lives, but in the world around us, so that we might catch a glimpse of God, that we might stop our busy lives, if only for a moment, remember and reconnect to God, our creator, and to those around us, to share in a communal experience of love, that could then be shared from generations to come. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. As we have breezed through this bird's eye view of what we profess to be true about God, 
I think the question that remains for me that I'm left with is why does this matter? What is the invitation for us as we profess these words in a creed together in the body of Christ in our worship? I think when Paul was standing before that group that ended up gathering on the front steps of Mars Hill, he wasn't simply listing facts that he had come to know about God. He was describing a God that he knew intimately, that he experienced for himself. He wasn't simply professing his own faith, but using a shared common Christian language to proclaim his own personal experience of God. These words that we say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, these words, they are a gift. They are words offered to us so that as our lips profess these beliefs, we might be able to identify where God has shown up for us as a parent, who provides comfort and love when we are afraid or alone. As an agent of transformation, when we look back and see God's power in our lives, at work, transforming our moments of despair into joy, transforming our deep grief into memories that we can hold on to, to transform sickness into health. Or we might experience God as an artist painting a tapestry of pinks and blues and deep purples in a dusk-settled sky. Or maybe as a scientist piecing together natural wonders like the moon blotting out the sun in the middle of the day. The invitation for us this morning is to allow God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, to empower us to take the words that we profess and to turn them into a proclamation of how our own lives reflect God's heart. To proclaim where our stories and our experiences share the story of who God is. To proclaim the good news of how God has shown up for us just as as God has shown up from generation to generation in the grand story of God's love for us. So friends, my invitation for you is to allow these professions to become a proclamation, to let God, the Father Almighty, continue to create in you a story of love as you then proclaim I believe in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.